Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, starting in verse 12. And as you're finding that passage, I do want to, as I always like to do, give you a little background on the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was written in about the mid-60s A.D., and the thing that it does, I would say, better than any other book of the New Testament is that it ties the Old Testament history and practices with the life of Jesus. It does that probably better than any book. Now, when we're discussing types of books in the Bible, it's generally called an epistle, but it wasn't really probably written as a letter. It you know, doesn't really have the greetings and all that that accompany a letter. It was likely a sermon that got recorded and was passed around from church to church. So it's kind of helpful to think of it in that light. It's also helpful to think that Hebrews was written to what are called second generation Christians or those who did not meet Jesus directly, but those who were one to Christ by the apostles. So those who, you know, came to know as the result of their teaching. So it's important to keep all that in mind. Just like to give you all that information to chew on before we read the passage, which is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. And if you would, as is our custom, please rise in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 12. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this scripture this morning, we thank you for divinely inspiring its writing and for it not only being applicable to the original audience, but that it is fully 100% applicable to us today. And Father, we just ask that we would be attentive to what you have to say to us this morning through this word. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> So, I know that it can be really rough out in the audience when you hear the preacher talk about something that maybe steps on your toes a little bit or is, you know, maybe preaching, you know, about something you've got going on in your life. It can be difficult. And would anybody disagree with that? You know, I have been out, I've been out in the pews and heard my sin talked about, you know, a few times over and over. I want to, I want to just assure you all of one thing, as rough as it is out there, it is also rough in the study when you keep getting confronted with things that you struggle with. It, it you know... It, it is really rough to then have to read this scripture, know how it applies to you, and then tell other people about it. So I do want you all to bear with me just a little bit. Um, 
I, I, I would say I can give a couple of good contrasting examples of how our thoughts and our motives and our words might be expressed. I have a friend who loves to tell a story about me that he was there for when I was helping to move some furniture. One thing of which was a 700 pound safe going up four steps into a building on a dolly. Well, I tripped going up the last step and this thing is coming at me almost, you know, they're, they're doing their best to keep it from landing on me. Safe is coming at me. It's like, oh no, boy, if that ain't a metaphor for life, but you know, safe coming at me, 700 pounds. I only know that because, you know, it was on the specs somewhere. And my friend is so amused because what I said in that moment as this safe is coming toward me is bad words, bad words, bad words. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but then these guys trying to lift the safe off of me were laughing so hard they almost couldn't do it. Now, that's amusing, but if we compare that to the time, you know, even more recently when I was informed that somebody who is only peripherally acquainted with the situation of my life was slandering my, myself and my family and by the way nobody here so <laughs> no, nobody here who are, or who is going to watch online later I'll just go ahead and relieve you all of that now but found that out and my reaction I was like angry for like a couple of days angry well I'm going to straighten this person out I will give this person a piece of my mind. And before you ask, yes, I can spare it. You know, it's like, I am going to tell this person about themselves and tell them about, you know, this and that. And the Holy Spirit's like, would you like me to tell you about you? Yikes. But the point in both of these situations is the thoughts. I want us to keep in mind that I must always keep my thoughts Christ-like. We are told here in verse 12 about the word, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart. Jesus himself said in Matthew 15, 19, and 20, for from the heart come evil thoughts. Murders, adultery, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. These are the things that defile a person. Which leads to a question. How often do we, or how often are we tempted to have an obedient body with a disobedient heart? How often do we do the right thing anyway while grumbling about it or while thinking, it really irritates me, I don't want to do this anymore. And in our heart, we're being disobedient. It's easier than you might be aware, or you may be keenly aware of it. We also read from the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 21, 22. You have heard it said was, that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. In other words, your thoughts about that person to whom you're angry. Yes, my thoughts about that person that I was angry to who doesn't know me anyway. I wouldn't recognize her on a street corner. Why do I care? But my thoughts 
about that person are subject to judgment. Or Jesus also said in that same sermon, you've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, the thoughts. The thoughts are what are being judged. Because the thought is only a very small step from the action. That's why the thoughts are so important. This is why the scripture is able to judge us on our thoughts. The point from Jesus' word is the reminder that outward obedience is not enough. It is good. It is not enough. It is not enough to be outwardly obedient if you were inwardly rebellious. When we are only outwardly obedient, what we do is we begrudgingly obey our Lord while despising his command in our hearts. And I'm sure most of you know what that is like from some experience in your life. After all, I believe most of us had parents growing up. Did any of you ever do what your parents said, even though you were so mad about it, you could spit because you had to? I'll give you an example from my, from my time in the military service. We used to have on Thursday afternoon uh, this thing called Field Day. And no, it's not fun and games like it would sound. I would rather it have been fun and games, but what it was, was you literally had to move everything out of a room, clean the walls, clean all the floors, you know, strip them, wax them, all that, clean everything that you had taken out of the room, put back in the room, and then clean the hallway, you know, the same way. It was a whole to do. Well, at my first unit, we had gotten a little lazy on our field day in our office spaces. And we hadn't, we weren't necessarily scrubbing behind everything, doing all this. Well, we had a new executive officer come through on a Thursday and said, nobody is leaving this evening until your area has been inspected. Oh, I was mad. I had plans that evening. You know, I was supposed to be out of there five o'clock. 10.30 that night, my area still hadn't been inspected. I was mad. I couldn't do anything about it other than be mad inside myself. Sure couldn't say anything to the guy. That could have got me in the brig. But I was outwardly obedient. But boy, in my heart, I was despising that man. I was despising his command. I was despising the town he was born in. on and on. You get the point. Do we do the same thing to our God? Well, I'll do what you say, but I won't be happy about it. I'll refrain from saying this evil thing to this person, even though they deserve it. But I'll think it all I want. I'll refrain from cheating on my spouse, but I will think about it. That is what it means to only have outward obedience. Those thoughts that we entertain in our hearts are subject to judgment. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, this is why he commanded us to take every thought captive to Christ. 
he recognized as well as anyone that your thought is only this far from your action. After all, how far is it from your brain to your hand? That's how close that sinful action is. And it starts here. Or as people in Bible times believed, here in the heart. You know, that word cardia that they used in the Greek, it, we recognize it now, but you get the point. It's not very far from this to this. It is not very far from I hate this person in my mind to I'm going to strangle you. That's why our thoughts are subject to judgment. Entertaining these evil thoughts puts our soul and our spirit at odds with each other. There are two Greek words, and you're going to recognize these words. You know, when, when this passage talks about separating your uh, soul and your spirit, that's how sharp the word of the Lord is. Soul is the Greek word psyche. Sound familiar? And spirit is that Greek word pneuma or breath. Separating your thoughts from your breath. That's how sharp the word is. When we entertain evil thoughts, we put our mind at odds with our spirit. And those two cannot live long at odds with each other. Therefore, we must deliberately intentionally re put those thoughts away. We must rid ourselves of our evil thoughts and keep our thoughts Christ-like. After all, we're commanded to do so. We are also commanded, of course, to keep our motives Christ-like. We read in the same verse, verse 12, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Any of you all ever been able to tell by a conversation with somebody that they have an ulterior motive? I'll, I'll tell you something. I don't think Tammy would mind me sharing. We were on our way to the grocery store, and the, her office phone rolls over to her cell phone, which then goes on the Bluetooth in the car when we're driving down the road, headed to the grocery store. So, this call, you know, comes in and this lady's like, this is so-and-so from what, you know, and she's trying to get an appointment to speak to the pastors. And she's talking about wanting to get to know them and talk to them. And, you know, and Tammy's like, well, ma'am, what specifically are you? She was trying to sell them insurance. Yeah. But then she continued, well, we're going to be praying for you. And it's like, thank you. But uh, yeah, here's the time you can catch the pastors in the office if you'd like to stop by and talk to them and try to sell them your insurance. It was, it was blatantly obvious when she answered the phone you know, what the call was going to be. Her motives were <laughs> so obvious. A lot of times we do things to, with, or for people, and maybe they don't know our motives. Maybe they assume our motives are right. But you know what? Even if the person that you're dealing with does not know your motives, God does. 
the scripture is able to help you discern those motives. I'll give you a couple examples from scripture. James chapter 4 verse 3, you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Talking, of course, about why we don't receive things we ask for. God knows if we ask with the wrong motives. That's why he never answered my prayer to win the lottery. Well, that and I never bought a ticket, but... <laughs> you know, the scripture talks about preachers with false motives. <laughs> Paul writes in Philippians 1.17, The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. I, trust me, those guys still exist today. God knows your true motives for everything you do. Which is only a problem if what you do is not out of genuine Christian love and concern. If what you're doing is because, well, I just have to. I feel obligated. Or, um... People will think badly of me if I don't. Or whatever that motive is that is not genuine Christian love and concern, God knows about it. And the scripture is able to point that out to you. It's able to convict you of that. I will tell you, that was part of what, you know, I, I told you that Tammy and I were being slandered a little bit by somebody not in the know of our situation. That was, the, that was the part that really irritated me is they were questioning our motives. But you know what? God knows our motives, so why should I care? God knows our motives. He knows our reason. And we will all face judgment for the times when we did things with false motives. Which then is why, and the most important thing I'm going to say to you today, is that I must rely upon Christ to help with my thoughts and my motives. This is the hopeful part, by the way. You know, I, I know I spend a little bit of time beating us all down, you know, little thoughts. Who, who hears it all the time in control of their thoughts? Yeah, see? <laughs> no hands for a reason. Who here, who here has perfect motives all the time? See? Y'all are honest. Y'all are honest when I, don't ask, when I ask you to raise your hands for something like that. <laughs> I must rely upon Christ to help with my thoughts and my motives. None of us can help that 100% ourselves. Verse 15 we read, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Note the importance of that. Has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. As the hymn says, Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. By the way, you're not fooling him anyway. He already knows those thoughts, those motives, those things that you wouldn't dare tell anybody else. Or those, those thoughts that you might only let slip out when you're around somebody you're very comfortable with. Now, those of you that were here last week may remember that we talked a whole lot about the importance of confession. Confessing our weaknesses to each other and confessing our impure thoughts and our false motives to someone else. 
And the, remember, the only purpose we had for confessing those to somebody else was so that they could join with us in praying that Christ would relieve us of these and that he would strengthen us. That was the only purpose for that. I want us to keep that in mind and tie it last week with this week then. Because we need help with our thoughts. We need help with our motives. We need help to show genuine love and concern for others. That way we can receive mercy. That way we read in verse 16, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Now, you know, we talked about judgment, 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 you know, the, the throne of judgment. Now look, we're seeing a throne of grace. When we confess our thoughts and our motives and repent of them, that throne of judgment becomes a throne of grace. We receive the help that we need because we ask. So I would say, let us go to him and see his grace today. And let us then work to bring others to the throne of grace. That's the thing I've been teaching you all for a long, long time now. We share the good news with people. The gospel is good news, but before it's good news, it is bad news. And what's the bad news? That's right. We are all born as sinners separated from God. I'm sure when I was talking about thoughts, every one of you had something come to mind you thought of that wasn't pleasant, that wasn't Christ-like. That's part of our sin nature. That's the bad news. What's the worst news? That's right. There is nothing we can do about it. Even if we could, you know, behave perfectly for the rest of our lives from now on, there's nothing we can do about our past sin. But then that brings us to the good news. And what's the good news? That is right. I, I love hearing that loud and proud. Christ did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He was tempted in every way like we are, yet he was without sin. And he paid the price for our sin on the cross. He died, was buried, spent three days in the tomb, rose again, proving that what he said was true. That's the good news. What's the best news of all? That's right. You cannot earn it, but you can receive it. You must, in fact, receive it. Let's be sure to share that good news with somebody this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this time that we've had together this morning. We thank you that we can approach the throne of grace that we can that we can have our thoughts and our motives that are unpleasing to you pointed out to us so that we can repent of them and turn away from them and we just ask at this time for your help in that Father, we also ask that if there's anybody here today or watching online later who does not know christ as their savior we would ask that this would be the day they would come to know him and it's in his name we pray. Amen.